Well, praise God. Let's just, let me just pray real quick. God, just be calm. Father, Lord, we thank you once again, Lord God, for the opportunity to preach your gospel. Holy Spirit, I pray that you, oh Lord God, would preach this morning, Lord, that you would preach, that you would teach, Lord, that you would speak what you desire spoken, oh Lord God. I know that I feel like you put a word on my heart, Lord, and I've prepared for it, Lord God, but I pray that you, oh Lord, would take over. I pray that I would yield my tongue to you, Lord, and pray that you would fill my mouth with your words, oh Lord God, that they wouldn't be the words of a man, but that they'd be the words of the living God, and that your people, Lord, that are called by your name, Lord, you're the good shepherd, oh Lord God. You're, you're, you never would flee and leave your sheep. You're the good shepherd and, and you desire to give them green pastures, Lord, and, and lead them beside still waters, oh Lord God, that you're the one that restores the soul of your people, oh Lord. And so I pray that you'd speak forth and that you'd feed your people this morning, Lord, with the truth of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Well, this morning I titled my message Apprehended. And I don't know, that's just the main thing that kind of came out uh, as I began to look at all the passages of Scripture that the Lord started to put together. Uh, it was kind of like a little bit of a different situation, to be honest with you, being out of town and on vacation. Uh, you know, the way that the Lord kind of knitted this message together. But he, I definitely know that He spoke to me about this. And, and, and we'll just see how, how it comes out. I never know how a message is going to come out, to be honest with you. I just trust the Lord and... and, and and put it down and, and, and ask him to speak. Amen. And but 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 one of the one of the main things themes that, that kind of was resonating in my heart, one of the ideas that I had and uh, had to do with something that, that takes place in the modern church a lot of times nowadays. All right. Now, some of you might sit in here and say, you know, preacher, I don't know why you're always talking about the modern church. I don't know why you're always coming against what other people are doing. Uh, but, you know, I don't know why you just don't preach the focus on the truth and why you feel like you got to point out everybody else's error. And the only reason I say that is because I've had multiple people tell me that in the past. And even recently, somebody told me, I just don't feel like I have to defend the gospel. Well, brother, I hate to tell you, break the bad news to you, but you didn't read your Bible. Because the Bible says that, that and Paul contended for the faith. Because, see, there were false teachers and there was false doctrine that abounded in the early church. Jesus constantly came against the false teachings of the Pharisees. He said that there was just a little bit of leaven in the lump. You know what leaven is, right? The reason I ask that is because one time I had a, uh, a situation of sitting down with a youth pastor and I was explaining to him that he was preparing the children really more to be comfortable in a club setting than he was in the church because that everything that they had done and produced was really like you were going into a club to the point where after I pulled my kids out and left, the, the situation had even worsened to where they had like little st stamps that they were putting on their hand and running it under like a fluorescent light when they walked up in there. And I'm like, this is just getting crazy. They turn down the lights, put on the fluorescent lights, hit the base, and, and, and you know, it's just like, well, what's going on here? And, and, and what it is, 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 and I didn't mean to get off on that, but I'm just trying to give you as another example of how the world has infiltrated the church, and that it's becoming real blurry on what's right, what's not right, and people are very, unfortunately, many people are very ignorant about what the Word of God really says. Amen. And the fact of the matter is, is that I was having a conversation with somebody outside earlier, you have different extremes of, of, of the church setting, you have some people that are so legalistic. We got them in town. Don't, don't worry. And hopefully one day if you ever show up in their church, you'll know what I'm talking about. So legalistic that there's not really allowing the Holy Spirit to be the governor of your life, to speak to you and, and, to, and to teach you the ways. But instead, it's rules and regulations that are set forth by a man that the traditions of men telling you what's, what's right, what's not right. Now, many times what people say in a legalistic situation is probably right. It's probably true that you ought not go see movies that are PG-13 or more. But the reality of it is, is that if you make a law in your life, I shall not see PG-13, that is not going to produce the life and the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's going to be you attempting in your own strength and, and, and your own power in order to bring forth holiness in your life that only the Holy Spirit, through the work of what Jesus has done in you, can produce in you. There's nothing wrong with having standards in your heart and in your life. But the next step is this, is that if you think by you living your life in such a way because you've made certain rules for yourself, I shall not cross this boundary. And then you look at somebody else that crosses your boundary you made. 
and you think less of them than what you think of yourself and you think of yourself as more holy, that's self-righteousness and that's Amen. legalism. That is not the life and the righteousness right. of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, I really went off on that, but maybe somebody needed to hear it. What I really wanted to say was is that there's a common saying in the, in the modern church. And I've heard this said before, like if a pastor is getting a new job, you know, in other, in other denominations and churches, it's very common. And I've seen this because I've been in leadership where it's like pastors are kind of like a CEO. You know, they're, they're like looking to upgrade their position. So they'll send resumes out all over the country and they'll put out little feelers, man. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm about to upgrade. I've been at this church for two years and I've got some experience. And so now I'm going to move up to a church where there's 3,000 people instead of just 500 people. And then this is how this takes place. And so when they'll show up at a new church or maybe it's not just a, a new church situation, maybe it's a, a, a new year. And he's about to launch a new series. And so what they'll say is, is that what we're going to do is, is that now the pastor's casting his vision for the church. You ever heard anybody say that kind of thing before? The pastor's casting vision. He's, he's giving us the vision or the direction that the church is going to go into. I got to tell you something, though. We don't need pastors to cast their vision Amen. for the church. Amen. Amen. Jesus has already casted vision for the Amen. church. Hallelujah. The word of God says, and, and, and we're about to go to that in Matthew chapter 28 here in a moment. But before we go there, I just wanted to share a little passage of scripture out of you with you out of John 17, because this is part of the vision that Jesus has casted for his church. Now, out of John 17, we shared some of this a while back on a Thursday night when we were reading. And what Jesus said was this. He was, he was praying to the Father. Je Jesus is about to go to the cross. And in the entirety of John 17, y'all can go to Matthew 28. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about John 17. Jesus is going to prayer to the Father before he goes to the cross. And he's having a one-on-one -on -one with the Father. And he's, and he's talking to the Father about the fact that he has endured and that he has accomplished on earth what the Father required of him and asked him to accomplish. And now he's going to the Father for the disciples. And he's saying, I'm not praying for the world, Father. I'm praying for the disciples, those that you've given me. And I'm praying, Lord, that you would hold on to them. And he says in, in verse 14, I have given them your word, talking about his disciples, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, I have to tell you this, and this is just the truth. When you begin to operate in the vision that the Lord has casted for the church, when you begin to operate according to what the Lord Jesus Christ has asked of his people, sooner or later, you are going to come against hatred from the world system. And many times you will come against hatred from people that are actually on the inside of the church. Because I'm here to tell you that the modern church is full of carnality and full of the world. What does the carnality mean? It means fleshliness. It means people that are still desiring to live for what makes them feel best, not as concerned about the things of God and the will of God as much as they are about their own plans and their own will. Many times whenever these preachers are casting their vision, it usually surrounds some type of a social agenda. You understand what I'm saying? We're going to feed the hungry. We're going to clothe the naked. We're going to go out into the street. We're going to make our community better. We're going to get involved in the community. The church is going to to fix the community. The church is going gonna, is gonna to help restore the community and cause love to... No, Jesus didn't die for the community. Jesus died for souls. Jesus died so that individuals might get a revelation of what he's come to do to restore humanity unto relationship with the Father. This, this work is an individual work. God wants to get you alone with him. God wants to get me alone with him. And he wants to have a sit down like he told Isaiah in chapter 1. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as wool. He wants to sit down and he says, come let us reason together. God wants to have a reasoning session with you and I. He wants us to come to the revelation that separate from him and his plan, we are all, and I'm talking about the preacher, we are all undone. We need intervention from the Holy Spirit in the midst of our lives. Now, whenever God gets a hold of the individual, 
And he begins to produce the process in that individual life the way that he desires to. What ends up happening is, is that that individual goes out into his community and he begins to allow the life of God that is on the inside of him begin to flow out of him. Amen. And begin to reach into the lives of other people where God has strategically placed each one of those people. Whether it be on the job, I've said it many times, whether it be at Walmart, wherever you may be, God. God wants to strategically place you as he prepares you for service, for his kingdom, in the right place, put you at the right time so that you might be utilized. That's the vision of the Lord. Amen. Amen. He says it right here. The world, the world's going to hate him because at first hated me. You, you understand this, right? I know I say it all the time, but I don't think we can say it enough that Jesus came from another realm. Peter talked about in his letter, he said, what manner of love is this that you've bestowed upon us? The, the word manner means from a tribe. It, the, the, script, the idea is that it comes from another place. Like it's a tribe that would be foreign to a, a tribe that had, this tribe here has never seen this type of thing before. And the idea really behind the, the wording is that it comes from another realm. The love of God comes from another place, another realm that is foreign to you and I. The language of God is foreign to you and I. Because born of Adam, you and I are born not only with sin, but sin produces selfishness. And you and I are all about ourselves. You ever heard of the word egocentric? Centered around ego. The word ego in the Greek is I. That, that's what the word ego means. Ego, E-M-I, means I am in the Greek language. That's what Jesus told them. But the word I, ego-centric, centered around I. The whole world is centered around me. That's why a two-year-old thinks that, amen? You got, that's why you got to discipline a two-year-old and, and, and teach them the truth. No, the whole world doesn't center around you because if you don't start on them when they're two, by the time they're 25, 26, 27, they're just a big version of that, thinking that the whole world centers around them. Jesus was opposite of that. Jesus laid self down, hallelujah. Though he was in the form of God, he considered it not something to be grasped to, but he hoped humbled himself and he became a servant so that he could die and not just any death but the death of the cross Hallelujah. so that he can restore you and I unto the presence of the Father. Amen? Amen. And so what we see is, is that God's got a plan. He said the world's going to hate them but this is what he says in verse 15 if you're, let me, I'm just reading to you out of John 17. John 17. Yeah, I told y'all to go to Matthew 28. I'm just going to read to y'all out of John 17 for a second. <laughs> Alright? I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm sorry. But Jesus says to the Father, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil. So Jesus isn't praying that you and I would be removed prematurely. It, part, of God, part of God's vision, part of the vision that Jesus has is that you and I would hang around this place for a little while. Now, if you still love this world, if you're still waiting for one more I'm not trying to pick on you, so don't get mad at me. Don't say, oh, I'm not going back to that church. That preacher stepped on my toes. I'm not trying to make you mad. I'm just trying to shoot straight with you and be real with you. If you are still waiting for just one more thing, oh, if I could just find that right person. Oh, if I could just finally have a baby. Oh, if I could just see my first grandchild, just hold off a little bit more. Then you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. You haven't come to a place, really, where you're hating this world enough. Amen. And, and longing for Jesus enough. You, you know, there's a dangerous thing that takes place. And we're going to probably talk about that tonight because we're going to be studying the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon came to a revelation. Now, when you're looking for anything under this sun to bring you happiness and fulfillment, you're going to probably find yourself in a great place uh, of despair and unhappiness. Because this fallen world is not going to bring you complete fulfillment. The only way that you're going to find fulfillment is to understand that there is a God in heaven that loves you and has a plan Amen. for your life. Amen. And so I want to encourage you to understand that. that he, he, but, but at the same time, even though there's a heart, the place in the heart of the believer, because listen, the apostle Paul said, it. he said, it'd be better for me to leave and to go be with the Lord. But for your sakes, see, it, until the Lord says time is up, either for you individually or for the whole plan to be finished, amen, and he takes us out of here, until the Lord, till the timing of when the Father says time is up, 
then we have a purpose on this earth. And part of the purpose Jesus is saying is, I'm not asking you to remove them. I'm asking you to keep them from evil. He goes on and says in verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So Jesus came from another realm where the love doesn't look anything like our love, where, where it's not about selfless, selfishness, but it's about selflessness, where it's not egocentric, where God, yeah, and where God wants to, to, to pour his love and, and his selflessness into us and to teach us his ways. And he's come here and now in him, his believers find a new life that makes them like him and thereby separates them from the rest of the world down here. Drawing a line in the sand and making it clear to those around them that there's something different upon this earth. That's why Jesus said you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And whenever you light a candle, you don't hide it under a basket or a bushel, but instead it should be like a city on top of a hill. And what a city on top of a hill does is everybody lighted, light, lit their candles at night or whatever the case in the midst of the dark when people walked in the valley looking to find that city. It was real clear. You could see it because it was lit up. It was bright and everybody could see that city. And that's what the life of a Christian is supposed to be a separation from the rest of the world. Making It's like a, you are a narrative, you are a walking story. Paul called us living epistles. I'm sorry, Peter called us living epistles. An epistle is a letter where the life of God is written on your heart and in your life. And as you journey this and navigate this, this Christian journey, you are bringing forth the story of God to those around Amen. you. Amen. Amen. He goes on to say in verse 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. The word sanctify literally in the Greek language means not only holy, but it also means separate. Once again, I'm not asking you to pull them out of this world, but that you would keep them from evil. I've given, I've given them unto you. I've given them your word. I'm asking you to separate them out through your word for your word. Hallelujah. Will bring separation. Amen. The truth of the gospel working in our lives makes us different than the rest of the world out there. And I got to tell you, that's part of the vision that Jesus has for the church. As he's casting vision for his people right here. This is right before he goes to the cross. But in Matthew chapter 28, verse 16, I know you're already there. <clears throat> this is what he said. This is what he wants. Now, this is after the cross. This is after the cross. And, and this is uh, before, he, b before he ascends unto the Father. And starting in uh, verse 16 of Matthew chapter 28. It says, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still, some doubted. But, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth, and to the ends of the world. Amen. Now, I want to just real quick, I want to tell you about another passage of Scripture that I believe has to do with the casting of vision. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Jesus tells his disciples, tarry for me in Jerusalem. And he says, whenever you care, that, that means wait. Wait for me in Jerusalem. This is before he is, he's ascending. He's about to ascend and go to heaven. He says, I want you to wait for me in Jerusalem. He says, you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you're going to be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. We know this as the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in the upper room, it says that tongues of fire were upon top of their head. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Now, i got to tell you that we're a Pentecostal church, meaning we believe in the message of Pentecost. And we believe that there's a second work of grace that takes place after your conversion in Christ where you desire. Now, you, God, the Holy Spirit's not going to jump on you and make something happen to you that you don't want to happen. The Holy 
Holy Spirit wants to give you all that you desire of Him. And the reason that He wants to fill you up with His presence and with His Spirit to overflowing is, it's like, listen, when you get saved, this is what happens. The Holy Spirit pours Himself into you like a cup. But when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, this is what happens. It's like the big picture, the cup's already full, and He just fills you to overflowing. And the whole purpose is not so that you think you can look more holy than somebody. The whole purpose is so that you think you can walk in more victory than somebody. The whole purpose is so that you can be a witness for Jesus because Amen. you need the strength of the Holy Spirit to fill you up and to operate in you and through you to make you a vessel so that you can be used by God so that as Jesus cast forth his vision, you can become one with him and his vision yes. and do the work of the Lord. Amen. Now listen, Amen. when you go back to Matthew 28, this is what he says in the middle of that verse. In, in Matthew chapter 28, verse uh, 18, Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus had power over the forces of evil. Amen. Now, I use these two passages of the scripture because I want you to understand something. That the vision that Jesus is casting forth has to do with two types of people. Number one, there's a witness. And number two, there's a disciple. There's no question that that is the vision that God has for his church. Witnesses and disciples. Amen. And if we're going to be a New Testament church, that has to be the focal point of what we are doing is worried about becoming witnesses and disciples. Now, the word disciple, it doesn't mean that you had to be one of the original 12 or one of the original 11 after Judas betrayed the Lord. No, what it means is that you become a learner of Christ. That's what the literal word disciple means, a learner of Christ. And it's a lifelong process. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But what I want you to know is this, is that God has a plan, amen, and he wants to fill us up with the, with the working and the operation of the Holy Spirit so that we can be used by him. And, and I, want, I wanted to bring you back where he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The, the fact of the matter is, is that, is that not only did Jesus bring another kind of love from a foreign realm that you and I don't even understand, he brought another power from another realm that you and I don't understand. You see, listen to me, we are so blinded. And when I say that, I mean, I'm talking to all of us as human beings. I'm talking to all of us, even as Christians. We're just scratching the surface of what God's trying to communicate to us through his word. Amen. I mean, I, I've had conversations. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I had conversations this, this week while I, was, while I was on vacation with people. And people are so clueless about what the word of God is trying to communicate to them, that they're walking around in blindness. And that's what part of our purpose is here upon this earth, that we would be separated, that we would gain the knowledge of God, and that we would take that knowledge and not hold it in, but that instead we would allow it to come out of us to minister to other people, to give them hope that they can become part, amen, of the eternal family of God. But Jesus said this, he said, all power has been given unto me. And in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or whenever you and I, even when you get saved, I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with some people. They act like unless you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you can't be used by God. I don't agree with that. When, when the Holy Spirit lives in you, you can be used by God. Amen. You become a vessel for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Then the same power that was resident in Jesus is now resident in you because the same spirit that raised him from the dead will now quicken your mortal bodies. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. What does that mean quicken? Give life. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to you, not tomorrow, when you resurrect and you see your glorified body, but today. Walking in spiritual darkness, walking in death, the same spirit that raised him from the physical dead will raise you from the spiritual dead and will quicken or bring life to your mortal bodies and put the strength of God on the inside of you and minister in you and through you. There's another power from another realm that, that is available to you, Christian. Jesus told the Pharisees when he cast the devil out of that man, they said he cast out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. That's what the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time, accused Jesus of doing. Jesus said, no. A man, uh, 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 when a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. And the fact of the matter is this, is that, is that Jesus made this comment and he said this. He said, if I cast out devils by the hand of God, 
then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he said, how do you spoil a man's goods unless you first bind the strong man? What he was talking about is this, is that the strong man is the enemy. Whenever, whenever Adam fell into sin, and what he did was this whole earth was created. We talked about this in the series that we've been teaching. God in the beginning created this earth for the purpose that his people, that he would have a creation that would be able to reciprocate love unto him. That would be able to have a relationship with him. And he created this earth for them to dwell on and for them to have dominion over the beast of the field and, and, and for them and the fish of the sea. But whenever Adam went the way of the enemy, then he relinquished his power over to the enemy and sin, death and the, and the kingdom of darkness through sin gained access into this world. And through that time frame, God has been about the plan of redemption, of making right all that's been made wrong in Adam. And the way that he always planned to do it was that through the last Adam, which is Jesus, he would make it right through what Christ would do on the cross. Amen. So when Jesus says that you can't take, spoil a man's goods unless you first bind the strong man, what he's saying is, is that he came from heaven, the other realm, to this earth, and through the work of the cross... He broke the power of sin and death because he had no sin and he therefore died for your sin. And because he paid the penalty for sin, he now has taken away the power of the enemy in the lives of people. He bound the strong man. It's as though the enemy was sitting in a chair, sitting upon his throne and just exerting his influence over people. What Jesus did at the cross is you might be sitting down, but now you're wrapped up. You're wrapped up. You're tied up. And because of what Jesus did, the believer that puts his faith in Christ, keeps his faith in Christ, has victory and access to the presence of God to be used for God. And we're talking about the vision that God has casted for his church. God has casted vision for the church. We don't need a preacher. Once again, up here, trying to cast his own vision for the church about a social agenda, about a community outreach, about a project out there. No, Jesus has a vision for the church. And it's to make disciples, and it's to be witnesses for him and for his kingdom. And he desires for you and I to get on board, amen, with what it is that he's doing. In Matthew chapter 16, verses uh, 16 through 18. kind of really repeating what I just told you, I guess. <laughs> Give you some scripture. It says Simon Peter, well, Jesus is asking him, who do people say that I am? In verse 14. And, and they said, some say you are John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. People are talking about Jesus. He wants to know what are the people out there saying. Jesus got, Jesus is a whole lot tougher than that is. I've learned that you don't always ask people what people are saying because sometimes you might get some feedback that you don't want to hear. But Jesus, he, he, he's cool. He wants to, he wants, I mean, when I say he's cool, I don't mean that irreverently. I'm saying that he's not overly concerned, he, but he just wants to hear what are people saying about him. He says in Simon Peter, in verse 50, he said unto them, but whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, we just got to slow down a little bit. And I know that most of you are getting tired of hearing it, but we got some new people, so just bear with me, okay? The word Christ is a title. The word Christ literally means, and some of you may already know this, but you need to understand, and I don't mean it silly, and if you thought this, I'm not trying to make you feel weird, but the word Christ is not his last name. It wasn't Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, what, what the word Christ means is anointed. Literally, in the, in the Greek language, the word is charisma. It's where we get the word charisma. And the idea has with it, connected to it, the smearing of oil. And that's how they anointed people in the Old Testament. Whether it be a king or a prophet, they were smeared with oil. Whether it be the high priest, Aaron, it was like the hot oil that ran down Aaron's beard. We've told the story on multiple occasions about young David being anointed as the king. 
whenever the whole, whenever the oil representative of the Holy Spirit anointed a person for God's service. But Jesus, you got to understand something. For thousands of years of human history, and once again, God revealing His plan, who He is, His character. If you don't know this book, you don't know God. I'm telling you right now, you might have been introduced to Him. You might have raised your hand one time in a service and said, "Yeah, preacher, I want that Jesus. I want that." But if you're not availing yourself to the Scriptures and you're not learning what the Scriptures are saying, the whole story and individual parts that relate back to the whole story, you are not learning about the character of God. You're not learning about who He is and how He wants to reveal Himself. To you, the scriptures for thousands of years of human history spoke of the anointed one. He would be the seed. He would be the sacrifice. He would come from the woman. He would come from Abraham. He would come from the tribe of Judah. He would come from King David. He would come. He would be born of a virgin. Hallelujah. And the New Testament tells us that that he was the word who became flesh. All of the Old Testament sacrifices, the Levitical sacrifices, the tabernacle and the way that it was structured, all of it pointing to Jesus, the Holy One, the light of the world. He was the bread from heaven. All that has connected to the tabernacle, the gold representing his deity, the bronze representing his humanity, the altar of sacrifice representing the cross, the laver, uh, back, uh, the, the washing of the laver of the Old Testament representative of the word that reflects the work of God and reflects the face of God and reveals the character of God to us. All of these things revealing the anointed one. All of that meaning right here that Simon, who do you say that I am, Simon Peter? You're the, the, the son of the living God. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the one that the prophets foretold. You're the one that we've been reading about. You're the one that mama and daddy used to put us to bed at night and told us that you would one day come. You're the one that Moses said that there would be a prophet that would arise from amongst your own people. You're him. You're here. You're in the flesh. God is real. His plan is real. And he has not forsaken us. Amen. This is all. It's, it's finally happened. It's been fulfilled. You are the anointed one. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Amen. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, i got to tell you that in case you've ever wondered, if you were raised Catholic, there's two words for rock in this passage. <coughs> one is Petra and one is Petros. And one means a large rock and the other means a small rock. And what it's talking about is, is that his name Peter means small rock in the Greek. He said, and upon this truth, well, he didn't say upon this truth. He says, he says, and I say to thee, Peter, small rock, that upon this rock, big rock, I will build my church. Upon the revelation that you just spoke of, or upon the revelation of who I am. The anointed one that the Father has promised throughout the ages of human history. I will build my church upon that rock, that large rock, the firm foundation of God's plan. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell are not going to triumph against the plan of God. Gates representative of access. We've already talked about this. But access meaning that through sin, through the, the wages of sin is death, and through the fall of Adam, the works of Satan, the works of darkness have gained access and gained a stronghold into this present world that we live upon. But God's plan, hallelujah, is that love from another realm, power from another realm, would show up upon this earth. And he said, all power has been given unto me. Therefore, go ye forth and make disciples of all nations. Hallelujah. Tarry for me in Jerusalem, and you will be endued with power from on high, and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the earth. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus has already casted vision for his church, and it's to be make disciples, and it's for you and I to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen? Hallelujah. God, hallelujah. Now, I, I, I used two different scriptures, one that talked about witnesses, one that talked about disciples. 
Real quick, I just want to talk to you. And when I think about a witness or a disciple, I cannot get my mind off the Apostle Paul. I mean, has there ever been a greater witness for the kingdom of God than the Apostle Paul? Has there ever been a greater disciple who actually created disciples through all of the teaching that he did, writing two-thirds of the New Testament, traveling the Mediterranean Sea, on foot, on, on sea, uh, in the boat, uh, being, he, he talks about the persecution that he endured. And I know I talk about it a lot, but out of 2 Corinthians where he says, five times, five times was I beaten with 40 stripes save one. What does that mean? 39 stripes. Why, why 39? Because he was a Roman citizen. And a Roman citizen could not be stricken more than 39 times with the lash. Now, I don't mean to go on and on about this, but some people say Jesus was hit 39 times. And the scripture doesn't say that. Jesus wasn't a Roman citizen. We don't know how many times Jesus was stricken with the lash. Five different times Paul was stricken with a lash 39 times. I don't know what that back looked like, but I can assure you it was scarred up. It was a mess. Three times he was beaten with rocks. Three times he was shipwrecked and left in the deep. He was in prison multiple times. He, he said that there were times that he was without clothes or food. He was in the cold of the night without clothing. And all of this wasn't because he was like some fool like Matt used to be before Jesus and worried about partying and living it up. But no, instead it was because he was living a separated life for the kingdom of God. He was choosing to live a separated life and giving it all for Jesus. Something got a hold of the Apostle Paul. I was talking to somebody about that yesterday. They were like, I need to let whatever got a hold of Paul. I'd already written the message. I need to let whatever got a hold of Paul get a hold of me. And I'm here to tell you that we all need to have that mindset. Whatever got a hold of Paul, we need to let it to get a hold of us. Because God has a plan. And Jesus has cast the vision. And it's all about souls. And you and I need to line up with what it is that God desires to happen. So I just want you to know the Apostle Paul suffered great persecution in his walk, in his journey as a witness and as a disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ. But can I tell you it wasn't always that way? Can I tell you that it wasn't always that way for the Apostle Paul? And as a matter of fact, God used both, God used two different men in, a, in an enormous way in the Apostle Paul's life that really bore the title that I'm talking to you about this morning. One was called a witness. The other one was called a disciple. And I'm just going to tell you a real quick story that the first one, his name was Stephen. The word martyr in the Greek, in the Greek New Testament is the same word that's translated as witness. That's really what a martyr is. Mm -hmm. The thing of it is, is that Stephen was the first one that the Bible records in the book of Acts that actually was a witness so much to the point that he lost his life. Mm -hmm. If you go back and you read Acts chapter 7, I'm telling you, He's probably, for the first year of my, when the Lord first started to open up the scriptures to me, he was my hero. That was before I really got a revelation of who Paul was. I'm talking about human yeah. heroes. Stephen, I just fell in love with that guy. I mean, he's just like one little blip on the screen. He's like a, a shooting star that just real, real bright, and then it just fades off and it goes away. He's got like two chapters. In chapter 6, he's called a deacon. In chapter 7, he's preaching. He says he was a man that was full of the Holy Spirit. He go and walks up to the religious establishment of the day. He, he faces those Pharisees in the eye and looks them in the eyeballs. And he begins to preach a message about salvation history. What are you talking about? He takes it from the beginning. At least starting with Abraham. And he walks them all the way through salvation history to reveal to them that the very one that they hung on the cross was the one that God had promised. Who was the anointed one that God had said of days of old that he would come. He said that God called your father Abraham out of a place called Haran. And he told him that he was going to make him a great people. And he talked to them about the fact that Abraham had Isaac. And Isaac had Jacob. And Jacob had the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes. And in Egyptian bondage, they swelled to a nation that God had delivered them out through the hand of Moses. Hallelujah. And he went on and continued to tell them. And then finally he comes to the punchline. And the very one that we were waiting on, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. You, you're hard-hearted just like your fathers always were. And you have hung him on a cross. You murdered and you killed the anointed one that God the Father had planned and promised for all of these years. Look at him in the eyes and tell him 
The Bible says that they became so enraged and so full of fury that they began to gnash upon him with their teeth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did y'all ever see that fight a long time ago with Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson? I used to be a boxing fan. I bought that fight. That was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. Mike Tyson literally looked like he was demon possessed. Evander Holyfield came out in that ring and he had a scripture. It says, uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He got in that ring and nobody had ever beaten Tyson before and, 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 and he started to put it on him. And the next thing you know, that this face came over Mike Tyson and he reached over there and he grabbed a piece of that man's ear and he bit it off in, the, on, in front of the whole and I'm telling you, it's the same demonic spirit that overcame that man that was even more so in all of these people. And the Bible says that they ran upon him and they gnashed upon him with their teeth. And at the same time, he says, I see heaven opened. And the Son of God is standing at the right hand. The, the, the Son, Jesus, he saw the heavens open up and Jesus standing. Now, I preached a message on that one time. Jesus stood because the scriptures are real clear that Jesus sat down. What that means is, is that the high priest of the Old Testament could never sit down because his work was never completed. You understand that? Because year after year, day after day, sacrifices had to be offered because the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. But after he offered himself once as the sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the Father where he ever makes intercession for us. But on that day, hallelujah, the Son of God saw a witness. The first witness that the Bible would record. And the Bible says that Jesus was standing up ready to receive Stephen, the witness, the martyr. For Jesus Christ. Now, Amen. why does what does that have to do with the Apostle Paul? Let me tell you what it has to do with the Apostle Paul. Because he was standing there. He was standing there watching the whole thing. He wasn't converted yet. His name was Saul. The Bible says that the witnesses or those who said, yes, Stephen is guilty, had laid their coats at the feet of one named Saul, who was a religious leader himself. And it says that he, he was the one in leadership. He was the highest ranking officer of the time. At least for the Jewish people at the time. And by them laying their coats. And he, he was giving consent. For them to do what they did. And they pelted that man with stones. To the point that he died. He died for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The next chapter tells us that the apostle Paul. Heads to a place called Damascus. Which is in uh in the area of uh, <coughs> Syria, uh, up north Israel. And he's going there to get from the religious leaders letters to be able to condemn Christians even more. To be able to put them into prison. And the Bible says that when he's doing that, all of a sudden a light from heaven shone upon him and knocked him to the ground. And all of a sudden, after he's knocked to the ground, a voice from heaven begins to speak to him. And asks him, Saul... Saul, why do you kick against the prick? Some translations say goads, and I know I've explained this many times. But a goad was a sharpened instrument that was used to stick animals in the hindquarters to make them go in the right direction. So the idea is that Paul is kicking against it. God's goading him, sticking him, pushing him in the right direction, but yet he is refusing to go in the right direction. He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. I'm, I'm the one that you persecute. And he can't see now. And he ends up in this place, a house, on a street called Straight. That's where I want to introduce to you the second <laughs> person. See, Stephen was the witness. God's got to cast, Jesus has already cast a vision. I don't mean to keep on being redundant. I don't mean to keep on beating a dead horse. But in case one day, you know, you have to move, you get transferred, you go to another town, you go to another church, and you see a preacher get up there, and he starts casting vision for his church, and he's telling you about social outreaches and community programs. Can I tell you something? You need to get up and you need to walk out and you need to Amen. find another church. Because Jesus has already casted vision for his church. Amen. And that Amen. vision that he's casted is for witnesses and for disciples to be made. Amen. And the second person I want to introduce you to is a man named Ananias. The Bible says that Ananias was a disciple. The word meaning again, a learner of Christ. The Lord spoke and said, Ananias, 
And he said, here I am, Lord. It reminded me when I read it again this morning, just to review it, it, it reminded me of Samuel. You remember, you remember young Samuel, whenever Hannah was barren and she finally, she said, Lord, if you'll just give me a male child, I'll dedicate him to you for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. And God allowed her to have that child. And, and when she gave birth and weaned him off the breast and brought him to the temple, he lived there for the rest of his life. All of a sudden he hears this voice and he doesn't know who it is. And each time he gets up, he thinks it's Eli. See, God's leaving Eli because Eli won't listen to him. And, and, and he's speaking now to this young boy, Samuel. But Samuel thinks it's Eli. He says, I'm hearing you talk to me. No, no, son, you need to go back to sleep. Finally, after about the third time, Eli says, it's the Lord. The Lord's speaking to you. Answer it when he talks. And whenever the Lord spoke to young Samuel, he said, here am I, Lord. Same words that Ananias spoke when he heard the voice of God. Here am I, Lord. And God told Ananias, there's a man named Saul. Saul of Tarsus. He's on a street called Straight. He can't see. I need you to go over there. And I need you to lay hands on him. I need you to lay hands on him. And I need you to tell him that he's going to have to suffer many things for me. That I have a purpose for his life. And when you lay hands on him, he's going to receive his son. The word of God says that Ananias was very concerned. He said, but Lord. This man's been breathing threats. This man's been putting Christians into prison. This man has been... you got to trust me. See, one of the things that I wanted to share with you also is this. You may not have to lose your life like Stephen lost his life. You may not have to fear for your life like Ananias was fearing for his life. But if you're so concerned about your reputation and how cool you think you are or your image or whatever the case that you can't open up your mouth and talk about Jesus without being worried about the fact that you might get talked about behind your back. I can assure you, if you talk enough about Jesus, people are going to start talking Amen. about you behind your back. Amen. And if you're going to be so embarrassed that you can't deal with that, you're probably not going to get a whole lot done for the kingdom of God. But let me tell you something. When the Lord apprehends you, because I know that that's what my message is supposed to be titled. I hadn't said that word one time yet. Apprehend. When the Lord apprehends you and grabs a hold of you, you are going to care a whole lot. I ain't saying you're going to be perfect. You are probably have some, you're going to have some issues that God is still going to be dealing with until the day that you die. But I'm here to tell you, when God apprehends you and gets a hold of you, it's going to change your perspective. You're going to start worrying a whole lot less about yourself. And you're going to start worrying a whole lot more about letting people know about this beautiful Amen. Jesus Amen. that died to set you free. Amen. 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 And so Ananias is like, okay, Lord, whatever you need. And so he shows up at the house. He lays hands on the apostle Paul. And the Bible says it was those scales were on his eyes and they fell off. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Bible says right after that? Immediately, straightway, is a King James word that means the same thing. Straightway, he preached Jesus in all the synagogues. He would show up over there in the old time and the places where the Jewish people would, would gather together. And, and whenever a rabbi or a teacher would show up over there, that's why Jesus showed up in the synagogues. A, ra a teacher, anybody could grab the scrolls and they begin to speak. To Paul who used to persecute Christians, now all of a sudden shows up filled with the Holy Spirit, immediately preaching Jesus in all of the synagogues. I want you to know, I don't think that we can even gain enough of a revelation to understand what just happened. Like as I was writing this down, it's almost like I wanted to tell you, no, I don't think you get it. You need to stop for a second and you need to, to comprehend and understand what just happened in the scriptures. The apostle Paul got saved. Hallelujah. The apostle Paul got saved and the angels of heaven began to sing. The, the, one of the greatest witnesses and one of the greatest disciples to ever walk the face of the earth has just been born again into the kingdom of God. And listen to me, it required great persecution for it to happen. It required great violence for it to happen. And I'm here to tell you it required a witness and it required a disciple in order for 
more to happen. Disciples make disciples, amen? And that's why you and I must be about our Father's business. And our Father's business, once again, oh, don't you just won't shut up, will you, preacher? And it's not about social programs. It's not about community outreach. It's not about finding different ministries in the church to keep everybody busy. No, it's about you and I learning how to be learners of Christ, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and taking Jesus with us everywhere that we go in hopes of the opportunity of being able to share a word, hallelujah, with somebody out there. People need to know the real God. Yeah, can, can I tell you, can I, have you tried to talk to people out there? I mean, I know some of you have. Amen. I haven't realized how little people know. And, and once again, I'm not, I'm not picking. I had this encounter while I was on vacation. I go work out at this place. And he, but I'm sitting in there in this little lounge area, and there's this guy that's an attendant. Well, I'm in there just kind of talking to him, and, and, and all of a sudden, it's just like the door opened up. And, and the door opened up about Jesus. And I, I went all the way from the Illuminati to Jesus. To, I mean, I had this guy for 30 minutes. So much so that it started getting kind of weird because some of his other guys, so I had to kind of back off because I didn't want to get him in trouble, but he didn't want to leave. He was a very intelligent guy. I could tell he was. Young African-American guy. I mean, great dude to talk to. But early on in the conversation, he made a comment that showed me he knew nothing about the Bible. I mean, he knew about a man named Jesus. But he said, you know, I just think that if people will do better and move in the right direction, and sometimes maybe our mantra is that we will try to live our life like Jesus. I'm thinking to myself, you can't live your life like Jesus. You, 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 I'm thinking to myself, you, you need to die. So I had to, at some point, we transitioned the conversation, and I started talking to him about the gospel. And I'm not going to go into all that I said, but, I mean, we talked about Jesus a whole lot in that 30 minutes. But he started to all of a sudden... Share with me an occurrence that took place in his life like four years earlier. He never forgot this occurrence. If God has ever spoken to you this way, you know what I'm talking about. You knew when God spoke to you. And it's something as simple as this. And I'm, I'm saying this for a purpose. About four years ago, he was working at Lowe's in the, in the tree department or whatever, the plant department. So a couple from Tennessee had come down to Pensacola and had visited the church in Pensacola. And for whatever reason, drove all the way to the Lowe's in Destin to look for a particular type of tree. It was a palm tree. Now, there's obviously multiple varieties of palm trees. I don't know nothing about palm trees. This guy, that was his job, to take these different trees off of the truck and the inventory and stuff. He said that when this one, and, and it, was really, it was really like it had affected him. I mean, he's talking about this four years later. He said, he said this is the, because I, I know what it was. I said, I said, do you realize that God is real, man? Do, do you realize that, that God is so real and that he's planned all of this to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin and that one day you're gonna, we're going to breathe our last breath here, we're going to take our first breath there, wherever there is, and we got to, listen man, if this thing is real, we got to deal with this. Our human soul is eternal. He said, man, he said four years ago this couple showed up and they said they wanted a tree. And as soon as she said she wanted a tree, she didn't even tell me a palm tree, whatever. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the name of the tree just <laughs> exploded in my mind. Out of nowhere. And then she proceeds to explain to me and tells me the name of the tree. And he's like, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is happening here? And he, she, she goes on to tell me exactly what kind of tree she wants. She wants it this, not only the type of tree, but it needs to be about this tall and, you know, all this kind of stuff. He said, I don't even think we have the tree because of the fact that we sell these trees a lot. He said, but we walk straight to, and there's one left, and it's exactly what she wants. And so I'm sitting there listening, I'm like, well, that's a really cool story. It sounds like the Holy Spirit really spoke and prepared him to know that this was an encounter from him. Because you see, God's trying to break through into people's lives. Do you understand that? God's trying to violently break through into people's lives. In the midst of darkness and in the midst of deception, in the midst of cloudiness and blindness, where people have been enculturated by the lies of the world and the darkness of Satan, God is trying, desiring to break through into people's lives and he uses witnesses and he uses disciples to do it. Amen. And he led that couple all the way from Tennessee by way of Pensacola to Destin, Florida in Lowe's just to have an encounter with that young boy. But see, talking about a tree ain't enough to convince me that this is an encounter from God. Because if this is a real encounter from God, then Jesus' name was spoken. 
So I, 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 I said, dude, let, let me say this. I said, I think you had an encounter from God. But before I say that, I got I to gotta get a time out here. I, I mean, what, what else did the woman say? She had to have said more. She had to have said something about Jesus if this was a real encounter. Oh, yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. What she said was this. You can talk about God all day long, young man. But if you're not talking about the right God, you could be talking about any God. She said, the God I'm talking about is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if that's not the one you're talking about, you're not talking about the right one. I said, dude, hold on a second. I said, God is trying to get a hold of you. You understand what I'm saying? I feel the Holy Spirit right now. God is trying to get a hold of you, young man. He is trying to have an encounter with you. He's intruding into the midst of your life. And on that message four years ago, the message was Jesus is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And listen to me. The message today is that you must be born again. Because I had told him that about four times already. And I said, you need to connect those two concepts together. And you, a smart guy, you need to start doing some studying. And you need to get a hold of the Jesus that's trying to get a hold of your heart. I want you to understand something. That the world is blind. That many people in the church are blind. That they don't know what the truth of the gospel is really teaching and that we have been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to become disciples and to make disciples of all nations. And that's what God has called us in this church to do. However big it may be, however small it may be, God has called us to make disciples for us all Amen. to become learners of Christ. Amen. And to take that Jesus with us wherever it is that we go. Real quick, Philippians chapter 3. I love this passage of scripture because it just reminds me of the heart of the Apostle Paul. And in verse 12 of chapter 3 of Philippians, he says, not as though I had already attained. In other words, there's something that he's looking for, but he hadn't gotten there yet. Either we're already perfect. In other words, I have not been completed. But I follow after. In other words, I continue to press forward. If that, I may, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The idea of the word apprehend and apprehended there means to be seized upon. It, it, it's, like a, it's like a seizure, not talking about a, 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 a medical seizure, <laughs> uh, an overtaking. Uh -huh. The Apostle Paul said I was overtaken by some type of a spiritual force. <clears throat> and well, he knows what the spiritual force is, but I was overtaken by something. Something grabbed a hold of me. I've been apprehended, and so therefore I'm pressing forward because I want to seize or apprehend that which apprehended me. In other words, he said, I have not attained. I have not been completed. I need to press forward and keep on striving and keep on searching and keep on crying out and keep on looking for that very thing that got a hold of me. I need to get a hold of it so that I can give it to other people. Hallelujah. The Lord apprehended him, but I just want you to know that God used a witness and God also used a disciple to apprehend to seize, to take control of the Apostle Paul. Now, he won't do it against your free will. But sometimes he'll make circumstances and situations that he'll put you in to bring you to that place of yes, Lord. Apprehend me, Lord. Use me for your glory. Amen? Amen. I'm going to just close with out of Matthew 16 because I... I really felt like the Lord put this man in my spirit. And I really didn't know exactly how I connected. But I feel as though the way that this man's part of his story, his legacy in the scripture connects. Is that what happened to him is kind of like what happens to people whenever disciples and witnesses intrude into their lives. Have you ever been intruded upon don't let me lose you this morning. I know I'm going on and on. But have you ever been intruded upon? And what would I mean by that? Before you knew Jesus, did anybody intrude into your little busy schedule in your day? I told y'all, I don't know if I told y'all the story or not, but when I went to Mississippi a while back, we did street ministry at a St. Patrick's Day parade. And the way that some, I kind of have a little bit of a different style of street ministry. 
the, when I do street ministry, I don't, I don't do, I don't preach like I do street ministry. That's just not how I do it. This is just how the Lord, after talking to thousands of people about Jesus, this is where God brought me. I'm, I'm much more soft in mind. And basically what I do is I just walk up to him. I'm like, hey, can, can I ask you a question, man? Now, I'm not opposed to the bullhorn. I mean, if you've got a bullhorn and that's how you do your thing, and I personally feel like you need to have a platform from what you do. Because, I mean, to me, walking up and down the street, but he, this is just my opinion. I don't know everything. To me, walking up and down the street with a bullhorn, people don't, they don't understand what you're really doing. And I don't know that you're getting their attention. But once again, I'm not opposed to the bullhorn. I'd rather somebody out there with a bullhorn than not doing anything. But I, for me, street ministries are more like up close and personal. And I'm like, can you just, can I just take a second of your time? Can you tell me what you think about Jesus? And so they'll begin to speak to me and they'll begin to explain to me. And I'll say, well, look, can I, can I ask you this? Can I, can I, what about this? And then I'll begin to, to talk to them. And most times, not all the time, many times, they're like, man, dude, that was good, dude. I appreciate that. You know, that, that went well. I, I learned, I learned something. I'm like, praise God. Sometimes I'll pray with them and whatever. Well, on this particular situation, now I'm talking about this because of an intrusion. That's what I did. There was two guys underneath a little tent. They were drinking, and there was two guys and a woman. And I could tell that they, they looked like they were homosexuals. And I said, hey, do y'all mind if I ask y'all a question? I just wanted to know, what, what is your position on Jesus and whatever? I don't remember really what all was said. But I ended up doing the majority of the talking. They weren't really, at some point in time, I could tell they weren't really that interested. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And and I could tell that basically it was kind of like it was I, was I was losing. It was time. You know what I'm saying? It was it had already been over time. Maybe it was time to move on and go find somebody else. And so I said, well, thank y'all, you know, for your time or whatever. And I started to walk away. And all of a sudden it was like I could hear the Holy Spirit speaking. He said, you intruded into their life. You intruded into their day. And I stopped. And I went back. And I said, this seems kind of rude, doesn't it? It was almost like they were like, dude, I thought you were going like, to what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, this, this comes across as rude, doesn't it? And it's like an intrusion. I mean, really, this is what's happened here. I mean, you've been confronted with a situation. You're over here. You're minding your own business. It's St. Patrick's Day. I've all this. You're minding your business. It's St. Patrick's Day. You're under your tent. You're visiting and having fun with your friends. And here this guy shows up, and he mentions the name of Jesus to you, and he intrudes into the midst of your life. But let me say something to you, sir. If what I'm telling you is the truth, and I am convinced with all of my heart that it is, that God so loved the world, that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for your sin, for my sin, so that we could be restored to him and have a relationship with him. That one day the party's gonna be over. One day the music's gonna stop. One day the fun's gonna end. And then it's gonna be facing the father, facing the judge, and the question's gonna be, what? Did you do with my son? And I said, sirs, you, you can't plead ignorance because God loved you so much that he sent someone here today to intrude into the midst of your day. Amen. To, in, to intrude and to tell you the truth about Jesus. And one day, I hope it's not too late, you're going to come to the realization and you're going to remember that God Send a messenger to let you know that he loved you. All right, now I'm done. Y'all have a good day. And, you know, I thought about that. I thought about that. That's how I'm connecting this, this character right here. That many times when we witness to people in their life, and, and listen to me, I know that all your personalities aren't going to be like mine, and you're not going to necessarily always intrude exactly the way that I do, and sometimes some of y'all are going to be a lot softer and a lot sweeter, and you'll learn your own techniques and styles as the Holy Spirit uh, leads and guides you, but nevertheless, I'm telling you right now, something spiritual happens, something violent happens in the spiritual realm when you introduce Jesus into Amen. the midst of an atmosphere. It, it, it changes things. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And so I was thinking about this guy, Simon of Cyrene. I'm telling you, man, I was like, Lord, give me a word for the church. And, and the Lord somehow put Simon of Cyrene in the midst of all this other stuff and put this message together. And in Matthew chapter 16, verses... I'm sorry, that's the wrong scripture. It's in uh, Mark chapter 15. Not even Mark. 
Matthew 27, sorry. Matthew 27 and Mark 50 is where it talks about Simon. Matthew 27, 29 through 32. It says, and when they had platted, y'all there yet? Almost. All right, cool. Well, you let me know when you're there. Okay. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> Matthew 27, 29 through 32. And when they had platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. Now, I want to go back to that passage, but real quick, I'm just going to read to you Mark 15, verse 21. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. I just find it interesting, the scripture is real clear on who Simon, who his children are. Now, you do understand that the Gospels were written about 30 years after the cross. And so, what you have to understand is that there's been 30 years of church history that has taken place. And the Holy Spirit uses all of that knowledge that's been taking place as he pins the scriptures. But before we get too far into that, I just want you to tuck that away in the back of your mind, that the scripture was real clear to say that Simon had two sons, one named Alexander, one named Rufus. All right. But I want you to think about this situation because what we're talking about is, well, first of all, being apprehended. See, the word apprehended that the apostle Paul used it literally, like I told you, it means to be seized upon, to be overtaken against, sometimes in a way, against your will. But whether you realized it or not, you were taken against your will. And I mean, granted, God doesn't break our free will. But once again, so he will intrude in the midst of our circumstances and overtake and allow. And that's what happened right here to Simon of Cyrene. He, the Bible says they compelled him to carry the cross of Jesus. Now, the words in the Greek are not the same exact word. The word for compelled and the word for, for apprehended are not the same word in the Greek, but they mean basically the same thing. To be seized, to be overtaken. Specifically in this word, to be taken against your will. It was actually a word, the idea was a Persian concept that Rome used, where the Persian army... You could just, and I've seen this happen in other countries, man. I worked in the oil field in Venezuela. I was over there for 45 days. And, I, and I'm not lying to you. I was over there for 45 days in a vehicle. We had a translator that would drive us to work on location every day, about an hour away. One day we were stopped at a red light, and, and there was a car that was behind a Jeep of military people. The military people got out of the Jeep, opened up the back doors, pulled the guys in the back seat out, Put them in the Jeep. I said, dude, what just happened? He said, oh, they just got enlisted into the Army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's how they do it over there. They just got enlisted into the Army. I'm like, Are you? yep, that's how they do it over here. And so the Persian government, during these ancient times, it didn't matter what you were doing. You could be going about your business, having fun on your day, and all of a sudden they would seize you and overtake you and use you for their purposes at least at that moment in time. The Roman Empire would do the same thing. That's exactly what happened to Simon of Cyrene. Everybody's over there for Passover. I mean, the streets are filled with people. If you can even imagine, if you've gone to the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival and you've seen the streets filled with people, or if you've ever seen other festivals, that's, that's what Jerusalem is like right now. I mean, it, it's packed. The streets are filled with people. And Simon of Cyrene, he's probably going over there, really, just to observe Passover. And he's got his two boys with him, I would imagine, his family, and he's going about his business. And all of a sudden, the scripture says they planted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, they blindfolded him, they slapped him, they hit him with rods, prophesied, son of man, who it is, 
that strikes you. They plucked his beard out. They spit on him. And here's Jesus carrying the cross through this crowded streets of all of these people that are going there for Passover. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Simon of Cyrene is seized upon. Simon of Cyrene is, is compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. Violently, he's thrust into the world of Jesus. I can assure you that people that were spitting on Jesus were accidentally hitting Simon of Cyrene. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's minding his own business and then suddenly, violently, he's thrust into the world of the Lord and he's now connected with him and in the midst of this connection, there's violence just like there was to Stephen the martyr. There's persecution, just like Ananias was concerned regarding his trip to go meet Saul. And now Simon of Cyrene once again has been violently thrust into the situation. And I was thinking, in the spiritual realm, that's what it's like. That's what it's like whenever we intrude into the daily lives of people. Sometimes it doesn't come across the way that you would expect it to. Sometimes they reject. Sometimes they come against what it is that we're telling them. But I'm here to tell you that if we will do what God has called us to do, amen, be led by the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit do the work. Let him fill you up and work through you. But when you do that, I can assure you, somebody's making a decision about Jesus. They're either, now, they may not make a decision right that second, but in their, heart, in their heart and in their mind, they are already determining whether they're going to accept him or they're going to reject him. And I can tell you that I have, by the grace of God, witnessed to enough people to where I have seen it happen. I've told you the story before about being on the, on the strip in Lafayette and my sister had already told me about Jesus and already planted seeds of the gospel in my heart and here we are walking and three of my friends in front of me and some college kids had just crazy enough to decide to go out there and pass out tracks and they offer one to my first friend. I don't want that garbage. Offer one to the second friend. Man, get away from me. Offer one to the third one. I don't remember what he said. Offer one to me. I try, For a second now, I was going to try to be cool like them. Something was tugging at my heart. Something was tugging at my heart. I was saying, you're going to reject me? You're going to reject me, the one who died? I mean, dude, I was, I was drunk. You hear me? And, and I said, give me that. And I stuck it in my back pocket. And I can remember the next day. I woke up and I sat on the edge of the bed. I put on the same jeans, as gross as that is. <laughs> reached back there. I said, what is this? And I pulled it out. And it was a picture of Jesus bleeding. And it said, all this I did for thee. And I sat there and I read that thing. I can still remember layers yesterday. I could have been more than 17 years old. And, and I, I can just remember. I didn't give, I didn't bow my knee right there. But I'm telling you, it penetrated my heart. And you just don't know yes. the effect. I'm here to tell you. I, I've seen situations where the same thing happened to me at the Shrimp and Petroleum Festival. First, dude, I don't want that. Second, dude, get that garbage away from me. Third, dude, man, leave me alone. Fourth dude, I told him, you mean to tell me you're going to do what your friends did? You're going to reject Jesus, bro? He died on him. Give me that. He stuck it in his pocket. I don't know what's going to happen to that. Gee, he was intruded upon. The Lord intruded his world. I've had a situation where I'm just trying to just encourage you right now. I've had a situation in the office. I've witnessed to multiple people in the office. I can remember about eight years ago. This guy came in there. He had one leg cut off. And he told me how he had been in a motorcycle accident. He was a Harley rider, and he lost his leg in a motorcycle accident. And he said his wife had just left him. And I don't know how it opened up, but I was very soft towards the Lord at that time. And I just started talking about Jesus. I said, dude, what you need is you need the Lord. You need Jesus in your life, man. And he was very open, and he was very receptive. And I ended up praying with him. I said, man, like, what you pray for me, dude? And you know, I didn't see that dude for two years. I didn't see that guy for two whole years. He came back. He had a big old smile on his face. And he said, man, I just want to let you know, after I left here, things changed. He said, man, I started going to church. He said, man, I gave my heart to God. He said, I've been living for the Lord. I'm like, praise God, you know? I mean, I, don't, I didn't see that. He didn't even really think about him again other than maybe pray for him one time after he left. I was another guy. Big old mean diver dude. And I don't know that he's really living for the Lord like he should. But I'm telling you. He was big and he was mean looking and he was intimidating. He wasn't happy. And, and, but yet, nevertheless, the Lord would deal with me. And, and I'm telling you, I don't get intimidated by much, but I'm like, man, this guy looks angry. And the Lord kept nudging me and said, talk to him about 
talk to him about me. And I can't tell you, probably five times I wrote down the prayer of salvation on one of them brown napkins up in the, in the clinic. And, and every time he'd come back, and I could never tell how he was feeling about, about the scripture, to be perfectly honest with you, because he never would smile. He was just always angry. And then one day he didn't show up. It was the ground. And, well, they had a little bit of trouble, you know. And, and he, was a, he was a diver. I remember that. And anyway, he went to jail for a period of time. When he came back, I'm telling you, for the next two years, he had, gone to, he had been going to a church. He had given his heart to the Lord. He was smiling. Amen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I still see him sometimes. And he's not really going to church like he should. But, man, he'll let me talk about Jesus. He'll let me pray with him every time he comes. I guess I'm just trying to say this. Is that God, Jesus cast a vision. Amen. Jesus cast a vision for the church. Yes. Praise God. And, and the vision that he cast is that we would be witnesses and that we would make disciples.